Hey, 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 there it is. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, let's stand up and worship if you don't mind. Um, Michael, will you lead us in a prayer? There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here come this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. holy spirit and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord, your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us 
Christ become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Hosea 6, 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us in pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so we can live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him, 
Then he will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains in early spring. just for a moment. Um, I didn't arrange this before the service, uh, forgive me, but if I could get a, a man, uh, or for a man to come forward, we're going to take up our offering. So just one guy per aisle, somebody come on up, and uh, we're going to do the offering. And uh, what we want to do is Alec is headed off to OBU uh, this fall, and uh, he'll be a student there at Washita, and he's felt uh, for several years I've had the joy of working with him and uh, seeing God's calling on his life, and so he, he feels that God's calling him to ministry leadership. Uh, right now, it looks like in the area of music, and I think you would agree that God has definitely gifted him there. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to take up a love offering, and this is going to go exclusively uh, to help fund his college um, and, and help send him to school, okay, because that's an expensive thing. So um, if you are prepared to give, 
uh, we would love for you to do that in these moments, and that's what it's for. And I just want to give you the heads up on that. And if you were not prepared to give tonight, uh, tomorrow during church, uh, you're welcome to uh, mark it on your envelope, uh, love offering, and uh, we'll get it to Alec, okay? Uh, thank you again for being here tonight. Uh, we hope that your heart is open to what God's going to do. I think God spoke very powerfully yesterday through Alec, Alec, <laughs> Alec and the band, but also through Brother Terry. And, uh, man, I just know that it connected with my heart and the seriousness uh, living after the cross. Uh, sometimes I don't take sin seriously enough, and that was one part of his message that really stood out to me last night is that, you know, how uh, Nehemiah mourned over the sins, his personal ones, but also the sins of his nation. I think that's something that uh, God really hammered home to me last night, and I hope and pray that he's speaking clearly to you uh, both last night and tonight. So we're glad that you're here. And as we uh, sing this next song, if you would, um, just as your heart feels moved and as you feel led, that you would give and uh, put that there in the offering plate. Thank you again for being here tonight. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. Spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon. Your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? I'll offer this heart. So I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my light to declare your promise, my soul now is So what can I say? What can I do but offer this heart, oh God, completely to you? So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. He is here. He is here in this room. In your heart, he is near nearer than breath and heartbeat, nearer than you are to you, nearer than second chances or next opportunities, closer than tonight or tomorrow. He is real, realer than touch, see, hear, smell, or taste, realer than reality, for he is your reality, realer than joy, pain, sorrow, realer than love of being in love. He is present like time, space, wind, silent night. He is waiting like creation. The Lord, like words on the tip of your tongue, like songs that are yet to be sung. He is beauty, orange, blue, every hue, every shade. Sunshine and sunset whispers his name. He is holy. 
he is spirit. He cannot be touched or explained. He is sweeter than second chances and sweeter than prayer. Grandmother's error, knees and wooden floors bare. He is son, distinctly three, distinctly one, the only one. The only wise, the only resurrector of lives. The king, he is the earth cannot dethrone him, nor any eloquent words can expound him. He is moment and voice and power and choice and words and deeds and skin, fruit and seeds. Naked hands, naked feet, wounded wounds that bleed. He is believed and trusted. He is enough. He is all. He is calm and purpose. Everything that we can sacrifice is worth it and more, much more. Our good deeds are mere penance. Even the score. He is below and wow. He is who, what, when, where, and how. He puts on the show. He is the one that we come to see. He is our soul cry and sinners plead. He is the epiphany. He's the one that no light one can kind the camera or come within million foot to. the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned and all of the one who Stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. I'll stand with arms high and heart amended in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. With arms high and heart abandoned In awe of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul to you surrendered all I am is yours I need three hours just to get over that. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. 
He paid the debt that we could never pay. And I don't know if we'll ever truly understand that. I mean, I hope that in heaven, I know we'll have a better understanding of it there, but I, I know down here that I cannot understand that. We have a problem. <laughs> We've got sin. What do we do with this? Sin makes this great gulf between us and God, this great chasm. He's way up there and we're way down here. And there's no way that we can get there by ourselves. After the fall in the garden, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit they weren't supposed to. A curse came about. There was sin. And from then, every man and woman who has ever been born, except one, has sin in him. On July 16th, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. died when the airplane he was piloting crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The two passengers on board, Kennedy's wife Carolyn Bassett and her sister Lauren, were also killed. The Piper Saratoga light aircraft had departed from Essex County Airport in Fairfield, New Jersey, and its intended route was along the coastline of Connecticut and across Rhode Island south to Martha's Vineyard Airport. The National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the accident had been caused by the pilot's failure to maintain control of the airplane during a descent over water at night, which was a result of spatial disorientation. Kennedy did not hold an instrument rating and was certified to fly only under visual flight rules. However, at the time of the accident, the weather and light conditions were such that all basic landmarks were obscured, making visual flight challenging, although still legal still legally still permissible. John F. Kennedy Jr. had become spatially disoriented and it led not only to his death but also to his wife and her sister. Spatial disorientation is the inability of a person to correctly determine his or her body position in space. The pilot is unable to correctly interpret aircraft attitude, altitude, or airspeed in relation to the earth or point of reference especially after a reference point like the horizon has been lost. In other, ways, in other words, you lose your way. You don't know what's up or what's down. You don't know if your airplane wings are tilted this way and you're slowly headed down or if they're the other way. You could be okay, but you don't know because you're disoriented. You have no bearings upon which to base your you know, your concept of where the ground is or where the sky is. Have you ever noticed one of those bumper stickers on people's cars that says coexist? It's got all the different, you know, religious symbols on it that form the letters of the word coexist. And, and I don't know a whole lot about that bumper sticker or who puts it on. I guess it's some kind of way to promote tolerance between religions or to, you know, Make everybody nice and not to step on each other's toes. But it seems to me that as we try to promote all this tolerance, we might also be breeding confusion. Now, who would want to promote or breed confusion? Certainly not Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. It's no wonder we become confused. If you just... Look at the TV, and boy, don't I harp on TV shows, but if you look at them, it's confusing. There's not a, you know, sometimes we look at Disney, and, and every Disney cartoon that seems to come on is filled with witchcraft and sorcery, and that's what it is. You know, it's dressed up pretty like the magical kingdom, but when they wave wands and cast spells, that's... That's witchcraft, that's, that's sorcery, that's, that's demonic. And that's what we put in our children. You reap what you sow, right? 
sow the seeds of witchcraft and see what you get. But people say, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's just a cartoon, you know? <laughs> That's what the devil would love you to think. When I was in college, I was more or less a hippie. I don't know what I was, but I didn't join a fraternity. I wasn't one of those guys, and I guess I hung around the hippies, and uh, I made a lot of bad decisions. But I remember one idea, and, this, and in college, it's so important, you know, like those years, whether you're in college or not, but that time after high school are some really formative years in your character, and you, you really form about, like, who I am and what do I believe, you know, and and I think in us, there's always this innate uh, desire to have a belief in something. Even if you're an atheist and you say, well, my belief is that I just don't believe in God. But college is a time where there's a lot of people coming at you from all different directions. And I latched onto this concept of karma. I mean, that's what all my hippie friends talked about. And, you know, it's kind of a... I didn't realize that it was, had anything to do with Hinduism or Buddhism. I, I mean, I, I had never went and read about it or anything. I just heard, you know, man, if I do good things, good things will come to me, right? Sweet. I could live my life on that, man. Just, just do some good stuff. And, uh, you know, it's like if I see someone on the side of the road, well, I went and helped them change the tire, so I'm due for some good things, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a shallow way to live. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing good, but it's never going to get you into heaven, and it's not going to make you, your sin atoned for before God. I mean, you still have sin. You haven't wiped anything out. It just seemed like something I could do, you know, anything except for facing Jesus and the cross, because the cross was offensive. I mean, I had to look at the real Terry. And the way I lived my life was offensive. My sin is offensive. Our country, culturally, has become really, really diverse. We've got churches, but we also have mosques, and we have temples, and we have places where you can take classes on Tai Chi and, and yoga. And there's like yoga everywhere now. And that's Hinduism. Well, I thought that was just a way to work out and exercise. No, it's a spiritual practice. And if it ain't Jesus, then it ain't Jesus. <laughs> that's all I got to know. From the outside looking in, we're like an airplane pilot nationally who's become spatially disoriented, or perhaps we're spiritually disoriented. It's so important that we equip our children who are rapidly becoming young adults with the truth and a biblical worldview. Now, I'm a pharmacist, so, you know, I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> I, love, I love those telephone calls. Hey, man, I know you're not a real doctor, but I got this thing on my leg. You know, come here and look at it. I don't want to see that, you know. I'm not a real doctor anyways. <laughs> you know, I'm... I may not be a real doctor, but I do know who can treat spiritual disorientation. I get a lot of calls about my grandma or I've got this and that. You know, a good doctor, and I, I make a lot of references for doctors, you know. Ah, he's pretty good. He doesn't seem to be, you know, too far off the point. <laughs> but with this, there's only one physician I can recommend, and that is God. That is Yahweh, Rapha, the healer, Jesus Christ. He is the one who will treat spiritual disorientation. If you died today, do you know where you'd go? I used to hate hearing that question. The other day at the gas pump, a guy came by and he was asking me for some money. And uh, I just happened to have some cash on me. So I was like, here you go. If you died today, do you know where you'd go? <laughs> and I didn't know what kind of answer I was going to get. And he said, I absolutely do. I will be in heaven because I follow Jesus Christ. I mean, he just witnessed to me. He turned, he, he just flipped the script. I was like, well, praise God, brother. We sat out there and talked for 20 minutes. 
<laughs> it's the most wonderful thing ever. Sadly, though, there's some people that they just look at you like, mm, I don't. What? I don't want to think about that. And sometimes I've sat through sermons where the preacher says, Are you saved? Are you really saved? <laughs> well, I thought I was until you asked me that. <laughs> but I am, and I do know where I'm going. I will be with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because I have accepted his gift of salvation. He did all the work when he died on the cross. There's nothing that I could have done to make it happen. All I had to do is accept a gift. That's it. I just had to say, Lord, thank you for dying for me. I confess I'm a sinner and that I needed you. And that is it. This world is not my home. My home is in heaven. I'm just passing through. I've received his precious gift of salvation, a gift that I could not have bought myself. And there is no amount of good karma that I could have ever acquired to make that happen. I have a firm foundation upon which to base my claim. And that is the word of God. That is it. That's all I need. If you ever doubt your salvation and you know you're saved, all you have to do is trust in Jesus. He said it in here, and that's all I need to know. If he said it, it's true. If I accepted his gift of salvation, then he said that I would be with him in paradise. And that's it. That's why I can sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." And y'all don't want me to really sing it because it doesn't sound good. <laughs> but once I was confused, I was lost. I floundered this way and that. But today, Jesus is my shepherd. I listen to his voice. He knows me and I follow him. There is no other way. There is no other way. And I used to wrestle with that before I came to Christ. I remember having a conversation with my mom and she was pointing me to Christ. And I said, well, Mom, my God's just not so limited to just provide one way to heaven. I didn't have any literature to back that up. I wasn't stand, standing on any holy Bible to back that up. That's just what I came up with in my head. That's just what I could tell myself to sleep better at night. Oh, Mom, Jesus isn't the only way. Surely the Muslims have part of it right, right? I mean, what about all the... The peaceful Buddhists, they just sit around and... Mm, that couldn't be so bad, right? There are two options when you die. We're eternal beings. And eternally, when we pass from this world, we will be in heaven or we'll be in hell. Where the worm doesn't die and the fire is never quenched. I don't want any part of that worm. <laughs> that worm, I don't want it. But don't take my word for it. After all, <laughs> biblically speaking, I am a lay student at best. At best. But you can take God's word for it. In John, 1, in John 14, 1 through 6, Jesus said, Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. And then Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the last night before his betrayal and death, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the days ahead. He knew it was going to happen. They had no clue. Even though he kept telling them over and over, the Son of Man <laughs> must be crucified. He'll rise in three days. They knew he was the Messiah, but they, didn't, they still didn't know exactly how Jesus was going to deliver them. The Jewish nation thought that the Messiah was going to come in some kind of form of an earthly king that would liberate them from all the oppressing nations around them and 
set up some supreme kingdom in all the world. Jesus liberated us from the bondage of sin. He is now enthroned King of Kings forever, Lord of Lords. Earlier in John 13, Jesus said, Children, I'm with you a little while longer. You'll look for me, and just as I told the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I'll tell you. Peter asked Jesus where he was going. Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will later. Later on in John 14, when Jesus began to tell them about heaven, that's when Thomas asked him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Don't you just love Peter and Thomas? I mean, you're, you're sitting with Jesus. Well, how do we know the way then? You know, it's like the, the people who will ask the questions that you're too prideful or embarrassed to ask, you know, in, in school. Like, oh God, I'm glad they asked that question because I was wondering it too, but I wasn't going to raise my hand. And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, before he said anything right there, declared his deity. Jesus said, I am. What Jesus meant is, I am. I am God. I am the God of the universe. I created the heavens and the earth. I am. The words I am reflect the very name of God in Hebrew, Yahweh, which means to be or the self-existing one. Jesus is God. He said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. My Father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. And the Jews replied to him, you aren't even 50 years old, and you see Abraham? Jesus said to them, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. At that, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple complex. The Jews clearly understood that what Jesus was telling them was that he is God. And I guess if it was anybody other than God, it really would have been blasphemy. Beware of false teachers. You know, we have a lot of people that come around my pharmacy, and especially the one on JFK, that come around looking for donations, and uh, they come in like, oh, we're on a mission trip, you know, we're going to, you know, wherever, we need some money. And I'm always real leery of that, you know, like, okay, well, what church are you with? You know, I, I, like, I want to know before I give any money. And on this particular time, our uh, Sunday school class had just gone through a study of different religions and, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, uh, everything other than Christianity. And this girl came in, and I cannot remember which church she was with, but it wasn't a church that followed Jesus. Because we were all about to donate some money to her, and then I asked her, well, what do you think about Jesus? Well, we think he was a really great guy and all, but he wasn't God. And, uh, and immediately I was like, oh, 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 I'm ready. And I just pounced on her and said, well, we're not giving you anything. You, just, you, you know, go on. Oh, Terry. Remember last night how I told you those times when Jesus just goes, bam? Well, about the time she hit the parking lot, he did it, and I was like, golly. She was a, probably, a, I don't know, 18, 19, a young. She was a vibrant, presentable person. And I had like an opportunity to, to share Jesus with her. I mean, it's like the door was wide open. Well, now, Terry, explain, explain your hope in me. She just said I wasn't God. Tell her why you think I am. But what did I do? <laughs> and we felt horrible. Me and Jennifer immediately was like, oh, what have we done? So immediately I got on Bible Gateway, and I mean, I'm printing off stuff from Revelations. We're like, we got to find her. We got to find her. And we saw they were in a van. It was like a scary, unmarked van. It was weird. 
By this point, they had gone across the street to the tobacco store, and we could see them from our window. We're like, there she is. Go, Jennifer, get her, please. Gosh, we just cannot let Jesus down. Jesus, Jennifer got her car and went over there. I mean, she went right over there, but she could not find that girl. It's like she was just vanished. Jennifer went up and down the highway looking at different businesses. She was gone. That opportunity was gone. Don't ever quench the spirit. Golly, when he opens the door, it's like everything you learn in church, you read the Bible. I mean, it's kind of like being a soldier preparing for war. You know, you don't want to go to war, but you are about to get to use your training. So in a sense, you know, it's exciting. We blew it that day, but we did learn from it. And And now I still ask the same questions. Which church are you with? And I say, well, who do you say Jesus is? You know, I make sure before I give any money that that we're on the same footing spiritually. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Jesus, the name of power. There's power in the name Jesus. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that Judas has betrayed him. He's really just waiting for them to come get him and take him to the cross. When they approached him, the temple guards He said, who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they said. And Jesus told them, I am he. Judas was standing with them, and when he told him, I am he, they fell back and fell to the ground. His name, the mention of his name, literally blew them off their feet. Listen to what the Bible says about his name. Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there among them. Mark 16, 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe in me, who believe in my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages. In John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may glorified and be glorified in the Son. In Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of, Lord, of the Lord will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's a promise that I like to stand on right there. Because I called on his name, and I know I'm saved, and I know where I'm going when I die. Do you? Have you called on the name of the Lord Jesus? And if you died tonight, do you know where you'd go? You know, politicians like to make a lot of promises, don't they? They're so easy to harp on to. Before they get elected, I mean, it's, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and we're just going to change this country. And then they get elected, and you're like, where'd my senator go? I can't even get a call back. I can't even get an email back anymore. (laughs) You know? Hello? All you can get is that, that call center and hope he gets your message. Like I said earlier, biblically, I'm a lay student at best. But I don't know of any instance in which God has broken his promises. In fact, I do know for a fact that God doesn't break his promises, that he can't break his promises, because God is not a liar. God is truth, and Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only way. Today we're so confused. The world today paints a picture that all roads lead to heaven, and we know that's a lie, and we know who the father of all lies is. Jesus is the true light who gives light to everyone. Jesus gives us the right to be children of God. What a blessing. I'm a child of God because I am in Jesus Christ. I mean, I've been adopted into a heavenly family. And that's enough for me to say hallelujah. Jesus gives us the right to be children of God to who? To those who believe in his name, to those who are born of the Spirit. Jesus said, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
That's pretty exclusive. I mean, you could sit in church your whole life. And unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you've taught Sunday school all your life. It doesn't matter if you hear every time the doors are open. If you haven't been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, that's scary, isn't it? I mean, I shudder to think on the day that I died, Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, man. It's a serious, serious thing we need to think about, isn't it? Jesus is our salvation. Peter drove this point home when speaking before the high priest in Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. Jesus is the truth. If you're spatially disoriented, if your wings are tipped, you know, pretty soon you're just going to be going in circles until you crash and burn. But Jesus is the truth. If you can't see your horizon, if you can't see the ground, then you're disoriented and you need Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went through several points of the law. Murder, adultery. He followed him with, but I tell you. You know, it's written uh, that man must not murder. But I tell you, anyone who is angered with his brother has already committed murder in his heart. It's written you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you that any man who's lusted after a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. Golly. It's like Jesus set the bar and then he raised it, didn't he? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, just like he said he was in Matthew 5. Psalm 119 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and all your righteous judgments endure forever. John 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Revelation 19, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And he judges and makes war in righteousness. Jesus is the truth. <clears throat> in our study of Nehemiah, we talked about how they repaired the wall and the gates. And one of the gates that was repaired was the old gate. <clears throat> the old gate represents truth. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths, which is the way to what is good. Then take it and find rest for yourselves. Too many Christians today want something new, don't we? The latest teaching, the latest experience. Nowadays we see Christians attempting to change truth to make it more correct, politically speaking, don't we? You just see churches, denominations just falling away from the Word of God, which is clearly, clearly revealed to us. I guess it keeps their, their, their pew seats full, doesn't it? If we preach a message that makes you feel good, oh, we'll fill this place up. And then the offering will look good, won't it? <laughs> the gospel will never lose its power. It will always be fresh. Jesus Christ died for our sins. That will never lose its power. That will never lose its value. That will never lose anything. It is the truth. It has always been the truth, and it always will be the truth. Truth doesn't change. That's, that's why it's called truth. Can you imagine if the truth of gravity was turned off right now? Oh, there goes Terry. It'd be utter chaos and destruction. I mean, our world would just demolish itself. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and he is the life. You know, nobody took Jesus' life from him. A lot of the Hollywood movies, they love to portray the, the flogging and all the physical aspect of it and how they just nailed him on the cross. 
But Jesus clearly told Pilate, you would have no power, no authority, if it hadn't been given to you from above. In John 10, <clears throat> Jesus says, this is why the Father loves me, because I am laying down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Jesus gave his life in order to give us life. Could there be any greater love than that? He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. Because he died, we have been freed. And because he lives, we live. In John 14, he says, In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. I just love the words of Jesus as he was on the cross and that thief, the dying thief who was on the other cross next to him, said, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus says, I assure, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Could there be any sweeter words than that? Today, if you're in Christ, you will be with him in paradise. Jesus never leaves you. He hasn't rescued us just to drop us in a pit later on. He's given us the Holy Spirit that cleanses our lives and empowers us for a Christian life. He gives us new life, and then he gives us the power to walk faithfully in our new life. Another gate in the wall around Jerusalem was the fountain gate. Remember what Jesus told the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well? Whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. Ever. In fact, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up with him for eternal life. Jesus is the great I am. Jesus is the only way to heaven. When it comes to righteousness, Jesus set the bar. Jesus is the giver and sustainer of life. Jesus is the answer for our world today. You can look at every problem we have. And it all boils down to sin. Jesus is the answer. Wars, bickering, divided nation, racism, murder, violence. Jesus is the answer for all that. So how's your spiritual flight? Any of y'all have air sickness? Vertigo, are you spatially disoriented? Do you know where you're headed? If you're lost, if you've wandered, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. He'll lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He'll do it for his name's sake. Is he your shepherd? Listen for his voice. Follow him. If you've never met Jesus, but want to know him, there's no better time than now. Tomorrow is never promised. Your next breath isn't promised. Jesus said in Revelation, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. Is Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? Is he tugging on you right now? Is he calling you? Can you hear him? Maybe you know him, but you've wandered off or you've grown lukewarm. God, I pray for those that you would bring them back right now. I pray that you would set their hearts ablaze for your name. God, and that those that are lost, that you would find them right now and that they would come to you for their salvation. Jesus said, I'll come in and have dinner with him. Friends, that's a dinner you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss.
Listen to him. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. He's the good shepherd. supper table I've got 240 birthday candles you know a lot of Christians lot, we, we celebrate our birthdays every year right and I got to thinking you know a lot of us as believers we need to have a birthday candle to remind us that I have been born again and then there may be some here tonight that's never been born again brother Terry mentioned that in John 3 you must be born again, Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. During this invitation night, I'd like to invite all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, come get a candle. Let's have a birthday party. Amen. Let's remember, I have been born again. Amen. Amen. And then if you're here tonight without Christ, have you ever been there when a baby was born? Do you remember the excitement and the joy when that baby's born? We would really love to celebrate with you tonight. I want to invite you, along with Brother Terry, and along with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the Bride, say come. Come get your birthday candle. Let's give our life to Christ. Uh, someone will talk, I'll talk with you, others will be here to talk, Eric's here, Michael's here, several others. Come get a candle. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this truth that we've heard tonight. And oh, Father, we don't want to be flying around in disorientation. We don't want to be disoriented as believers. Help us to keep our eyes on Christ as your people so that we can fly a straight path to glory for your name's sake. And Father, for any dear soul here tonight without Jesus, as Brother Terry said, help them to just call upon you tonight. Receive you. Be born again tonight, friend. In Jesus' name, you come. Let's stand. Come get a candle, brothers and sisters. Keep that candle as a reminder. I've been born again. I have a birthday. And if you're here without Christ tonight, come, and we'd love to pray with you right here tonight.
Cause you are strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure, you are good, always true. I can. 